Well, we've got a lot of content to cover, so we won't do full group introductions, but if you would like to, go ahead and put your name, uh, organization if you have one, and preferred pronouns if you would like, and we'll go ahead and dive on in. So many of you know me, but if you don't, my name is Tyler Offerman. I use he, they pronouns. I work for the Kentucky Equal Justice Center as our food justice organizer. And I am one of the support staff for KFAN. And I am joined by uh, the effervescent Kimmy Ishmael. And you can introduce yourself, friend. Yeah, so I am Kimmy Ishmael. For those of you who aren't familiar, I am also part of KFAN staff, but I am a part of uh, Community Farm Alliance. I'm their policy campaign coordinator there, so do a lot of work uh, in the agriculture space. Great. And uh, Robin, the KFAN coordinator, our air traffic controller, our cat herder, uh, Many, many titles and hats, but thanks for holding down logistics, Robin. And we can go ahead and dive on in. So, hey, friends, as we said, this is the Kentucky General Assembly preview orientation. Uh, we will we will try and cover a lot. We're going to get um, deep on some things, but we're also trying to keep it a little high level, uh, many folks have varying degrees of experience when it comes to engaging with the General Assembly. So with that being said, please stop us if you have a question, if you have a thought. <clears throat> We're a big-ish group, but not so big that we can't just hop off mute or pop a question in the chat. So with that being said, we can dive on in. So this is our agenda for today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the process, uh, a little bit about the people, and then a lot about the politics and the policy, the four Ps of our work. So we're gonna get into some of the KFAM priority bills. We did not do <clears throat> like a full, these are all the bills. It would take hours and hours to go through all of them, um, but we will have plenty more time to talk about the bills that come through this session. Cool, so quick overview. This is the um, Kentucky version of the Schoolhouse Rock video that many of you have seen, how a bill becomes law in Kentucky. I won't read every word on here, uh, but it is um, here for your review whenever you would like, but the basic gist of it. A bill is introduced in either the House or the Senate. It then goes to the leadership. Uh, committee on committees is what it's called here, but that's the leaders in the, you know, in the House or the Senate. Um, obviously, the majority party has a majority humans on that committee, so they really decide what goes where or if it goes anywhere at all. If it is released into the wild, it'll go to a committee. It will receive a hearing. A bill needs three readings uh, before it can be voted on. So, you know, oftentimes that reading happens in a committee, but not always. There's always shenanigans in the General Assembly, but it has to pass the House. It has to pass the Senate. If any changes are made in one, it has to be voted on by the other. There can be a real sort of ping pong thing that happens for bills that don't have agreement between the House and the Senate. If it overcomes all those hurdles, it goes to the governor. The governor has to sign it um, or he can choose not to, but it would become law either way or the governor can veto it. In Kentucky, the veto authority is very minimal. The legislature only needs to come back and vote on a simple majority. So when the governor vetoes something, it's usually a message and not too consequential. But that being said, I sped through that. Uh, sometimes the General Assembly will speed through that. We can get into some of their trickery here in a minute. But the way the process should work is that the bill is given enough time for constituents, stakeholders, and legislators to review it. 
and ideally they pass a bill with input from all those folks. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen, but that's how it should work. Any quick questions just about, you know, the bill, how it becomes law? Cool. All right. Well, uh, before we get into this piece, which Kimmy will talk to us about, we are in what's called the long session. So in Kentucky, there's a short session and a long session. Long sessions are even numbered years, short sessions are odd numbered. They have 60 working days during this session because the main thing they need to do is pass a budget. During odd numbered years, there is no budget. Our budget is a biennium, it's a two-year budget. So that's the difference between the two sessions. There's a couple other differences, but that's the fundamental difference. So it started January 2nd and it will go until April 30th. And then I'll hand it over to Kimmy to talk to us about some of these people. Yeah, so um, so talking about the reason we're talking about candidates and elections, because it is election year. So um, if you want to go to the next slide, Tyler. So this year, um, all of the House seats are up for election and half of the Senate seats. And I believe it's all the even numbered um, seats, Tyler. Am I correct on that? <clears throat> That's just the Senate. For the House, every seat is up for election. Yeah, yeah every house, uh, every seat in the House is up. Um, so there are some key people that are either not running for re-election um, this year or have resigned. So um, up here, we've noted that uh, Representative Brandon Reed, he's actually resigned. He's going to go uh, work at uh, KDA underneath the Ag Commissioner. Um Josie Raymond also is not going to run for a re-election. She's out of Louisville. She's going to run for city council there. Uh, Katura Heron, um, she's not running for House next next session, but she is running for Senate. So she's filed in the Senate. Um, you can see there's a lot of unopposed districts, and we have about 23 uh, districts with primaries against incumbents. So that's kind of interesting. Um and uh, there are listed, you know, the others that aren't going to be running for re-election next, next year or next session. Go to the Senate. And here we have um, just what the uh, House of Representative map looks like. It's very colorful. Um, maybe you can see your district there. But... Um, so Senate wise, we have three uh, senators who are not running for re-election. Uh, John Schickel, who has been there for a while and um, uh, pretty well known there. Uh, Damon Thayer, who is the uh, Senate Majority Floor Leader. Um, and Whitney Westerfield, who um, we have also been uh, talking with that is the sponsor of Senate Bill 34. Um, some unopposed districts, and we have about five primaries that are going to be against incumbents in the Senate side. Are there predictions about who the next floor leader will be? Oh, I don't know. Not that I know. Oh, there's plenty of hot gossip, but no. I mean, nothing. None, none of that will checkable crystallize <laughs> until like November or December. Yeah. And here's the Senate map, um, a little bit easier to see the districts um, in the Senate map there. And now uh, we're gonna talk about committee chairs and leadership. Um, so the, the people who are really um, holding a lot of power in the legislature. So in the House, it is, um, Republican majority, super, super, super majority, um, I believe less than 20 Democrats. Um, so we have the majority um, leadership, which is Speaker of the House, David Osborne, um, Pro Tem, David Mead, floor leader, Stephen Rudy, and then we have caucus chair Suzanne Miles and whip Jason Nemes. Um and then we have, of course, the minority with Derek Graham, Cheryl and Stevenson and Rachel Roberts. But 
the committees are also very important. So note if you are in these people's districts, know someone in these people, these are their legislators or representatives. Um, let them know that their person is very important and they need to be in contact with them. Um, so the three uh, committees that are bills that we are supporting would probably go through these three uh, listed here, agriculture, appropriations and revenue, or families and children. Um, these are the chairs and vice chairs of each of those committees. Um, so we have Richard Heath and Daniel Fister for Ag Committee, um, Jason Petrie and Brandon Reed, though pending since he is resigning um, for a &R, and then uh, Samara Hevron and Steve Riley for Families and Children. Um, and I was also going to add real quick, just because the terms for leadership are sort of weird. Um, but, you know, the speaker is the the person that coordinates everything. Right. So they're the ones that call on people when they raise their hands. They're the one that facilitate the actual session. The pro tem is considered the like vice president. So when the speaker's not there, the pro tem stands in and they're the two most powerful people within the chamber. The floor leader is the person that actually calls the bills and wrangles the things when they're um, you know, in session. So they're the ones that go through the agenda and all that. The caucus chair, this is maybe a, a less well-known position, but every day the majority and minority parties huddle together before the session starts and that's called their caucus meeting. The caucus chair is the, that is the facilitator of that group. Um, so they're the ones that sort of do the behind the scenes. The whip, uh, sometimes called the vote whip, that's the person that actually gathers votes and makes sure that a bill will pass. So each person plays a slightly different role. But when I mentioned the committee on committees earlier, it is all of the leadership. So it's those eight people right there. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, Tyler. Um, yes, and... Um... Same in the Senate. So in the Senate, we have the Senate president, who is Robert Stivers, uh, Senate pro tem, uh, David Givens, the floor, the majority floor leader there, Damon Thayer, uh, caucus chair, Julie Racky Adams, and whip is Mike Wilson. Uh, mi minority leadership, we have Gerald Neal, Reggie Thomas, and David Yates. Uh, same with the Senate uh, committees, we have agriculture, a pro a and r and families and children so ag is jason howell and gary boswell um then a and r chris uh chris mcdaniels and amanda mays bledsoe families and children with danny carroll and julie rocky adams um so if like we had mentioned earlier like note if these are your legislators or senator or representative or you know someone who might live in their district these are people that we need, you need to be reaching out to and uh, connecting with. Yeah, and on a previous slide, we had a link where you can find your representative or senator if you're not sure. Yes, in the LRC website. So there are other committees, uh, statutory committees, um, and that uh, consists of the Tobacco Sediment Agreement Fund Oversight Committee. So, um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it is um, a settlement agreement that was that came about in, I believe, 2000. And um, it is to go, uh, it is money from tobacco sales to Kentucky. And this uh, committee oversees where that money goes to. It's 50% agriculture, 50% health. They decide um, how that money is kind of allotted, so. We have Amanda Mays Bledsoe and Myron Dossett. All okay. right. Turn over to Tyler for budget. Now we're going to talk about the budget. So we we breezed through a lot of that information, and it's partially because we want to give good time so we can dig into the bills and make sure to answer y'all's questions. Uh, but if you have any questions about that or this piece, which I will move through quickly, you know, please do follow up with us. But as I mentioned, it is a budget year. Uh, technically and legally, the only bill the General Assembly has to pass is the budget. 
And it is a, you know, massive document. Some call it a moral document. And in Kentucky, um, oh, I'd have to double check. I meant to look this up, but it's about 20 to $22 billion in federal or in state funds. Uh, there is federal money on top of that, but so it's a lot of money. Um, and what are they gonna do? So over the last 20 years, Kentucky historically has not had very much money when it comes to uh, being able to invest in things that we all care about. Uh, you know, we can point to a number of reasons for that, but fundamentally, you know, there is the uh, budget and then there's what they call the surplus. So every year as we bring in tax revenue, we have, um, you know, like the budget that we passed last time and any monies that we raise over that threshold is called a, a surplus. So we have a historically high budget surplus. It is currently at $1.4 billion. So that means we could fund all of the budget that we had passed last time and still have $1.4 billion left over. A lot of that is COVID era federal funds, but because of inflation and everything costing more, the amount that we pay in sales tax also goes up. So tax receipts are also up, um, but tax receipts, they're up, but they are um, decreasing. And that might be confusing. How can they be up, but going down? And you know, over the two years, tax receipts are up, but in the last couple months, they're starting to decrease. And that's because the General Assembly in 2002 passed a bill which started us on what they call the March to Zero. So they want to cut the income tax down to zero. The way that the bill is structured, it cuts the income tax rate by half a percentage point every year as long as certain conditions are met. And those conditions are uh, for the Budget Reserve Trust Fund, which is where the surplus goes, sometimes called um, the rainy day fund. So there must be an amount that's greater than 10% of tax revenues during the fiscal year. And then the revenues must exceed spending by at least the cost of a 1% cut. So what, do the, what does that mean? Uh, it basically means, you know, they want to put some money away in case this tax cut experiment doesn't work out too well. So in other states, they have not done the put the money away. And this has caused an almost immediate collapse of the state, the economy. You can look to Kansas if folks wanna see recent examples of this happening. So um, while it might be fiscally prudent for them to come up with a backup plan, the <laughs> cutting of the income tax does nothing to help uh, poor, working, and arguably middle-class folks. Most of us pay a lot more for things. So we pay higher sales taxes and usage taxes, where if you're exceedingly wealthy, uh, the thing that you pay more would be your income tax. So I say all this to say we have a lot of money. And unlike years past, the General Assembly cannot say we don't have the money to invest in some of these things but they are also simultaneously trying to stockpile as much of that surplus as they can because perfect example, there wasn't enough in there this last year and they didn't hit their triggers. So what, is the, what does any of this mean? Once we start to talk about taxes, things can get a little wonky, but here is a graph that shows the budget reserve trust fund. You can see that in the past, we have not had very much which is far under what experts recommend we do. So it is good that the General Assembly is putting money into this fund. However, their plan to, again, just you know sock away a whole bunch of money so they can have a backup plan in case their tax cuts don't work is not good fiscal policy. And it means that we cannot invest in the things that we all care about. How much are we talking here? So over a biennium, if they cut the rate half a percentage point each year, so that would be a 1% cut in over a budget year. And this just shows you in 
um, millions of dollars. So we spend, you know, 2.5 billion on Medicaid. So their tax cut would be 1.2 billion dollars. And you can compare this to some of the other things that we invest money in. So it's a massive amount of money. And we'll, when we talk about our priority bills, you'll see what some of those investments are, but totaling up all of what the, what the cost would be for our three priority bills would be um, just about, but a little under uh, one year of their budget cuts. So not cutting the tax uh, rate for one year would be able to pay for all the things we're about to talk about. And then lastly, what does our tax code look like when you add it all up? So this is Kentucky's tax code. When you add sales, property, income, all, the, all of the taxes. And we have what's called a regressive tax code where the folks that make the least pay the highest as a percentage of their income. So this whole march to zero will only make uh, this more lopsided and result in us having less money to invest in the things that we all care about. So any questions about any of that? Have other states done that march to zero? Yes. Tried to? Yep. Um, several states. Uh, some are in the middle of it. The legislators love to point to Tennessee as their model. Uh, the thing that they don't point out is that in Tennessee, uh, a lot of things have a sales tax applied to them that we don't, such as groceries. They also have a local option sales tax. So if you go to Nashville and buy something, you might be paying a 14% sales tax there. In addition, they have twice the corporate tax rate that we do. And the thing with sales taxes is like, it's all fine and good if you have a tourism-based economy. Florida has no sales tax. Um, but if you don't have a whole bunch of people from outside of the state flooding in, like into Nashville or into Dollywood, to buy things, it, it doesn't really pan out. Yes, Andrew, you have your hand raised. Yeah, my question was about um, the reason why we're not getting the things we want funded. It sounds like since the income tax cut won't kick in unless there's sufficient other revenue coming in, um, it sounds like roughly the same amount of money is going to be available. And isn't it more that the things we care about aren't what the legislature cares about, and that's why we don't get them passed? That's certainly a part of it, Andrew, right? Um, our priorities might not be their priorities, but the process that they're going through where they will ratchet down the tax rate also necessitates them cutting the budget overall. So yes, there would be less money for our priorities or they might choose to not invest in our priorities, but the process they have undertaken means that there will be less money for everything. So even the things that they ostensibly care about, there, there just will be less to go around. Any other questions? And also if we're and if we for some reason don't see see, just put it in the chat as well. I'll try to me and Tyler will try to be watching it as well. Um so yeah, now we'll talk a little bit. Uh since we have a little bit of background, now we know budget is coming up. There's a lot of money, so how can we use that money? Where can that money go uh, and do some good? So our KFAN's top three priorities that were voted on at our annual meeting, we have, um, we actually have bills to go along with those priorities this year. Um, and they are all actually already introduced into the legislature. So we're watching them. So we have uh, priority number one, which was help feed more Kentuckians by improving Kentucky safety net that um, is going to be uh, uh, Senate Bill 34. Uh, we'll be talking more about that today. Um, 
And just so you know, we will be talking more about each of these bills and priorities. Um, I'm just going to kind of give a brief overview, a reminder of our priorities. Um, our second one, feeding more hungry children and support education by providing more free school meals. There are two bills, one in the House, one in the Senate. So we have Senate Bill 40 and House Bill 198. And then the third priority, supporting local agriculture and food systems and feed more hungry Kentuckians by establishing the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund, which is House Bill 93. And we'll start right. with Senate Bill 94. Yep. So first in the list when it comes to expanding and defending the safety net, as Kimmy mentioned, Senate Bill 34. So this is a very large bill. It comes in at about half a billion dollars. And it would be a massive, maybe the largest investment in a generation into Kentucky's safety net. Senator Westerfield, for folks that don't know him, is the chair of the Judiciary Committee. I would consider him a... Um, I don't know, a Bush Romney Republican, I guess. So, you know, old school in that way. <laughs> but he is also a very well known anti abortion advocate and legislator. He wrote the abortion amendment, which was recently defeated in Kentucky. So, um, some of our organizations have mixed feelings, but when it comes to this bill, there are no abortion provisions and it really is focused on providing wraparound services for mothers and people who are giving birth or families with small children in them. So there's a bunch and we don't have time to go over it all. That being said, we did um, in-depth trainings on each of these issues towards the end of last year and when we send out this recording, we can link to those YouTube videos if you wanna get more into the weeds. But <clears throat> this bill is starting in the Senate. It's been committed to appropriations and revenue. It has yet to you know, be given a, a reading or put on any agenda. So it's a good sign that it moved out of the committee on committees, right? It's not gonna die there, but a and R is probably not the best committee for it to go to, um, just because the chair of that committee is, uh, some might say ruthless, but anyways, there is a, a lot of good stuff in here. Of the food provisions I wanna particularly lift up, it would create a cents per meal reimbursement for local food in schools. So schools that buy local food would get reimbursed. Um, and I'd have to go back and double check the language. I think it was 10 cents uh, per meal, but I should have double checked that. But it is, in addition to investments in the WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, it would create a um, or direct the state to apply for a waiver so that people who are incarcerated could enroll in SNAP before their release date. So that way they had uh, SNAP food stamps as soon as they got out. And then lastly, it creates a transitional SNAP benefit program <clears throat> where once a um, mother or a household with a child uh, can, like they become over income for SNAP, they don't immediately lose all benefits. They're actually moved over to WIC and are given a, um, I think it's equal to half of their SNAP benefit for six months. So it's sort of a, um, a phasing down of the benefits instead of a hard cliff. And there's a bunch of other stuff in there, um, but we're focused on food. So I'll focus on those pieces right now. Let me double check. Um, um, I'm gonna... Lori has. Oh, sorry. Oh, did you read my mind? <laughs> yeah, um, I was gonna and, and ask a question in the chat. Yeah, committees are they are bicameral during the interim, but not during session. 
So the House and the Senate committees, um, they are separate when they gavel in. And then Dala, to your question, I, it, I think it is less than 33 cents. I might be able to pull up the bill language while we're here just to double check. Oh wait, I have a printed copy next to me. Um, so <laughs> I'll be able to get that answer here in a second. I think the, yeah, the 33 cents, that is a perfect segue into the next bill. And this one is, um, being filed in the House by Representative All and the Senate by Senator Chambers Armstrong. And just a note on this, there are a couple strategies to get a bill passed. Um, sometimes one chamber will sort of lead the charge and they'll pass their bill and then send it over to the other chamber. But sometimes um, a House member and a Senate member will coordinate and file the same bill in both chambers with the idea that it sort of doubles their chances and if one gets hung up, then it won't end the bill. So it, it is not necessary, but it's sort of a, um, you know, maximize your options kind of strategy. But you can see uh, it's a short bill. You know, Westerfield's bill, I think is 42 or 48 pages. This one clocks in, I wanna say at three or four. So it's not a, it's not a um, real school meals for all bill in the sense of it creates sort of a backdoor way to do it by um, encouraging schools to participate in community eligibility provision, which for folks that don't know what that is, if a certain number of students qualify for free and reduced lunch or are on a qualifying public benefit program, then every child in that school or district gets free lunch, free meals. So this would basically set up a state fund that schools could pull from. Um, but in order to get money from that fund, it, the products have to be Kentucky grown. So it's, it's simultaneously a local foods bill and a free school meals bill. But I know Dala's on here or other folks that might have more to say. Cool. Well, with that, we will turn to the third. So the third priority um, is the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund. Um, its bill sponsor is Myron Dossett. Um, if you might remember from earlier, he's the vice the vice chair of the Tobacco Settlement Committee. Um, it is uh, the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund would dedicate a small portion of state funds to help programs meet federal grant match requirements. Um, for programs that specifically use Kentucky grown products and help those uh, on benefits, whether that be um, SNAP or WIC, um, even seniors as well. Um, so a lot of uh, so a lot of barriers that nonprofits have uh, is meeting a federal grant match requirements. So a lot of times you can get a grant, but it requires up to 50% match. And that's a very hard uh, ask and lift for a lot of smaller nonprofits that run very successful programs. Um, so this fund would help them leverage those federal dollars um, for that. Uh, and it leverages those Kentucky grown products, supports both farmers and consumers, and hopefully creates that sustainable system that we can use to improve not only access, but health um, in, in Kentucky. And just like a, an example for a program that it could help, uh, like Kentucky Double Dollars, if y'all are familiar with that, Seniors Farmers Market Nutrition Program, or even Fresh Rx for Moms or other prescription programs. So that is a little bit about House Bill 98. Um, it is currently introduced, has not been assigned to committee yet. It 
hopefully will be assigned to a committee in the next couple weeks, um, possibly to ag committee. So that is what's on the horizon for that currently. Yep. And uh, to answer your question, Dala, I pulled it up. So for Westerfield Senate Bill uh, Section 32, which can be found on page 41, appropriates $1 million in each fiscal year, so $2 million over the budget for 20 cents per meal reimbursement. So theoretically, if Westerfield's bill passes as it's written and Representative All Chambers Armstrong's school meals bill pass, then that would add up to 53 cents uh, per meal reimbursement on the table for schools for local foods. Which is the reality we want to see. Yeah. And we need your help to do it. So how can you do that? So there are many ways to engage in the General Assembly. Sometimes it can seem like a intimidating process, um, but I, if you leave here with nothing else, then know that these folks work for you. They literally cannot have this job if it isn't for the constituents you included in their district voting for them. And you know, while they don't always act like it, and a lot of um, elected leaders seem to you know, make decisions based on interests that are contrary to their constituents. In the end, they know that. And if enough of their constituents care about something and express that to them, no matter what their leadership tells them, no matter what their donors tell them, if they don't keep their constituents happy, they will lose their job. So they work for you. So as far as the bills, um, they're, or sorry, Kimmy, were you going to do yeah, this? Line? Sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, so um, as far as bills go, uh, we need you all to um, stay informed with, by those bills by either attending our working groups because we are actually having legislators come and talk about some of these bills um, on our uh, upcoming working group meetings. We have Representative All coming next week to the child and adult feeding. So things like that. We're also going to be sending out weekly um, emails on Tuesdays, um, action alerts, uh, ways to keep you all engaged and updated on different advocacy opportunities. Um, and then there might be some coming up that might we might need to call on you for a meeting with a legislator, maybe submitting some committee testimony. Um, but we are currently gathering a lot of materials and um things uh, that will help you all advocate so uh, and get the message out there that ranges from social media posts talking points one pagers handouts for you all to be able to use um, and stay informed with this great <clears throat> and here's just um you know we went through and gave just a very simple sample uh for each of the bills and there, we have a little bit more information about this as far as the specific ways to engage, but you know, you can generally think about it as face-to-face, uh, -face, right? So you, you get a meeting with them, you see them in public, you stop them on the street, uh, how, however it happens, uh, and you have a conversation with them. Another is to send a message directly. So that can be done through email, that can be done through leaving a message on the LRC call line. You can see that number down there at the bottom. Um, but there's also, you know, indirect ways to communicate with them. You can write in your local newspaper. You can, um, you know, figure out where they go to church. Uh, and if you're friends with that pastor. So there's a number of ways to like convey the message. But here's just, you know, very simple. If you were to write an email or call and leave a message, you know, this is a great bill. Um, we need a strong safety net so that our neighbors can find stability while we care for our families, find good jobs, live healthy lives. 
So, you know, when it comes to leaving a message that's not face to face or on some other forum that allows for, you know, more word count, you know, you want to think about who are you? Are you their constituent? What's the bill? And then what's the like one to two sentences that really drives home its importance for you? And then obviously, as Kimmy said, we'll get a bunch more information and materials out for folks uh, so that you can do that on multiple forums. But And then similarly for the school match program, you know, there is usually kids are considered the more deserving among us, right? I think I personally have problems with the kind of deserving versus undeserving narrative, but fundamentally like, if you can't agree with feeding kids, then where are you? So, you know, the importance of feeding children, but also connecting it to local agriculture and supporting local farmers and producers. There are um, not many things that are sure to doom your political future in Kentucky, but being seen as anti-farmer is probably one of them. So, you know, anywhere we can make that connection to not just helping people who are hungry, but supporting local agriculture, it's very important. And you can do that here in this bill as well. Yeah, I mean, Tyler per said it perfectly. Um, uh, House Bill 93 uh, really wants to connect um, farmers to uh, to their communities and make them healthier through programs that are already successful or new programs that are coming about that can help bring consumers closer to uh, the people that grow their food. Um, so yeah, email them, um, spread the word. Like we said, we'll have graphics and other things like that for you all um, calling the message line. Um, but like Tyler said, you don't want to be anti-farmer so you get um there's a good balance there of feeding of you know and becoming a healthier community in that aspect as well great so you know we we breeze through some of that um what might the opposition to each of these bills look like hmm well let me see if I can, why isn't it letting me go backwards? Ah, all right. So Senate Bill 34 there, well, I actually have breaking news. Um, a bad safety net bill was just filed today and it is House Bill 235 and it would appear to require every person on SNAP to participate in the employment and training program, which is another way to basically say like, you have to prove that you are working in order to be worthy enough to eat food. Um, so, you know, there, there is a, an unfortunately long established narrative in this country around the safety net being full of these moochers who don't wanna work and these undeserving folks who should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So there, there's a lot of folks uh, who have you know, swallowed that myth, swallow that lie. So yeah, unfortunately there's a, a number of folks who even if it's only directed at kids and pregnant folks might still just be opposed to a strong and expansive safety net. I find that with the, sorry, this cat's practically a human baby and won't get down. Um, I find that with those cases, there's a lack of understanding of child care shortages and costs. And so there's this idea that, you know, even a single parent, if they want to work, they can just easily find child care and pay for it. And that's not the case. And I would say the same group that would oppose that bill might oppose the Kentucky Proud School Match. I have had legislators tell me to my face that it's not the school or the state's responsibility to feed children, that's their parents' responsibility. So same thing here. And then 
Kimmy, I, I honestly don't know who would actually oppose this bill, but... Yeah, I was going to say the only pushback we've had, and I would say it would go for all the other bills as well, and it's just money. Um, money asks, I guess, um, figuring out how how much are hungry kids worth, you know? Um, but that is probably the only only thing. Of course, we would always want more money for for kids and programs that that help farmers and feed hungry people. But um, I think that's the only. But as far as like opposition, not much, not any that I've encountered so far. Yeah, I would say we put them in the order of um, scale. Right, Westerfield's bill is huge. It would impact a whole lot of people. The school meals bill is about $20 million. It would impact a lot of kids. Um, the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund could impact a lot of people, but you know, it is, um, you know, the ask is not too big and the population is, you know, like it's a it's a more narrow subset. So yeah. And I didn't mention it, but the ask currently we're asking for one dollar per SNAP enrollee. Um, and that is looking like a possibility. So that might be a little over $500,000, but so yeah, in comparison to 16 million and a half a billion, you know, $500,000 isn't a lot uh, in comparison. So a couple tips and tricks we wanted to go over um, just, and we will have hopefully a, a little bit more space for questions at the end. But the most powerful words you can say is I'm your constituent and I vote. So, you know, when it comes to reaching out to folks, you can leave messages for more than just your representative, right? If you call the message line, they'll ask you, well, what's your name? These are your representatives. Would you like to leave a message for them? You can, but you could also say, I wanna leave a message for all of the House Agriculture Committee. So you can do that, but you are not going to be the constituent of all those people. So, you know, they may or may not care. But if you start your, your message, whatever it is, with I'm your constituent and I vote, you know, that little, that little flag is going to go off in their head. I think it's, it's really important to connect the issues to your life and to your community. Legislators, ideally, would legislate based on facts and data. Oftentimes, it's based on anecdotes and stories. That is not always good. But the thing about stories is that they're much stickier. And it is, it's uh, an ability to humanize an issue and a bill, but also it's, you know, they might just not be able to forget it. And that's, you know, that is the, the point of the story. A couple of main messages we have there, you know, these are just some thoughts, but we have the money. It is much better to prevent than cure, right? When it comes to hunger, illness, disease, child malnutrition, investing in the safety net is economic development. On Kimmy's slide, it points out that, what is it, a, for every $1 invested, $8 in economic return? Yeah, $8.45. And then we already mentioned supporting local ag and farmers, but each of the bills that we laid out does support local agriculture and farmers. So that's a message that you can weave through all of it. And then, you know, here's just a couple of things. Um, meeting face-to-face -face is best, but it's not always easy. But if you are, you know, if you're gonna get a meeting with a legislator, expect a, it to be really short, especially during session. Um, if you can't get a hold of them by using their email, try and find out who their staffer is, the person, that, the person at their desk that manages their calendar. That can also be a way um, most likely to get a meeting if you're a constituent. Chris McDaniel, the chair of the Senate a &R Committee, will not meet with anyone unless a constituent is present. Well, unless you're like the Chamber of Commerce or something. But be polite, but have a clear ask and don't let them wiggle out of it. They will try. I've had legislators use the most creative tactics to get me off track. And, you know, you know, that's a great point, Senator. I had never thought about breast cancer in men, but what I'm here today to talk about is, uh, 
And then lastly, if you can't get a meeting, so there's something called bird dogging. It's literally named after the dog that chases after a bird when you go hunting. Find out where they are and ask them to talk to you. There's a couple ways you can do that. They, they are likely to be in one of three places during session, in their office, in a committee, or in the chamber. So if you know their schedule, right? If you know they have a one o'clock appointment at a committee, stand outside their door and wait for them to come out and say, hello, so-and-so, I'm your constituent. I've been trying to get a meeting with you. Can I walk with you while you go to your committee? Same thing with chamber. They always, they all have to go to the chamber at the same time. So standing outside their office and waiting for them, offering to accompany them. Uh, leaving messages. So when you call the LRC call line, there's a thing called a green slip. So the very nice people over there, uh, they are all very nice. Do not be mean to the LRC call center people. I'm telling not. Do not be mean to them. They are so, so kind and nice, truly. I don't know what drugs they're on. <laughs> but often before a vote, they will ask like their staffer, tell me what the green slips are. And they literally, it's just a stack of green paper and they will divide it by support and oppose. So if they can just visually see that their constituents, you know, it's a higher stack when it comes to support or oppose, it, you know, it might not change their mind every time, but it's an important thing that they consider. Emails, you know, if you have a specific story that you want to tell, because when you call the call center, you can't say very much. Um, they're literally typing word for word everything you say. So, you know, two to three paragraphs, it'll take you 30 minutes to get them to type it down. Anyways, if you have a specific story or if you want a response, then email might be best. We mentioned power mapping people in their community. You know, th they don't just have to hear from you. You can be mobilizing people around them to create that sort of echo chamber. And then lastly, monitoring um, will tell you how to watch the hearings, but it's a great idea to watch the committees that they're on. If they say something you agree with, tell them. If they say something you don't agree with, tell them because they need to be reminded sometimes that you know we are watching and we're engaged. Whoops. Um, I'm not gonna go over these, but a couple other things, editorials, writing in the local newspaper, talking to reporters, especially the small town rural legislators, they read their local paper. Like they, they keep an eye on it. So writing in the editorial section is a great idea. And then connecting your story with whatever the issue is. Right. So that was a little bit of tips and tricks for when you are actually meeting with the legislator. But here are some little tidbits for just uh, the accessibility at the Capitol when you're there and getting there and everything. Um, next. So if you are going to visit in person, Parking there can be somewhat confusing um, because there's a lot of different parking lots. Um, most, uh, well, all of the parking spots that are reserved are marked reserved. Um, there is a parking garage there. The first two levels of that parking garage are reserved only and from levels three and below are available to others to park in. So thinking about that. Um, what to bring, you always want to make sure that you have your ID so you can go through uh, capital security. Um, then noting that the uh, cafeteria is in the basement of the annex. And, um, and that is where a lot of people hang out. That's where a lot of people, you know, talk to one another, hear, hear all the hot goss and tea. Um, that can come from the cafeteria, uh, and that's in the annex basement. There's also a snack bar, like a snack store down there as well, where you can get some other things. And then the other place people like to congregate is the library, and that's on the first floor. 
Um, and they're super helpful in there as well. So if you needed anything printed off or anything like that, they're really helpful in there. Um, but getting once you're in there and you need to get to your meeting with your legislator, um, it's good to note that first floor is committees, second floor is the Senate, and then the third and fourth floors are the House uh, members. And we don't currently have it, but Kentucky Voices for Health has- oh, I dropped it, the links down there at the bottom. Oh, yay. So we have the link to the uh, to the accessibility guide for the Capitol. So if you all need more information on how it's accessible, feel free to look at that. Um, and then, like Tyler said, we when it comes to monitoring, there is a KET live stream and they have an app for that. And you can download the app and watch all the committee meetings, watch all uh, what's going on in the chambers. And you can also watch on the YouTube channel, but then they also upload every, after every committee, everything gets uploaded to the YouTube channel. So you can go back, watch what you missed that day um, and see what was on there. All right, questions. Yeah, I also want to acknowledge we, we swore we would leave enough time for questions. And as always, we ran over a little. So it's just about four o'clock. If you need to go, by all means do. Um, we will send out the recording and the slides, uh, but we are happy to hang around for a couple minutes. If there are some folks that had some specific questions, we're happy to try and answer them. But if you do have to leave, thank you for coming and be sure to anticipate much more updates and information from us uh, as the General Assembly progresses. Hey, Tyler and Kimmy, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment um, going back to the green slips. Um, if there is a call to action, um, those green slips have been impactful in some other um, bills or things that I have been involved with that when um, we advocated so hard that they said, please tell them to stop. Please tell them to stop calling because those green slips were just taken over. Um, so anytime that you can make a connection or advocate advocate for a bill that that um, is pa that you're passionate about or that needs movement, and you can make that call or an email, it 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 does matter. Totally. Yeah. I love that, though, that they were like, stop calling. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions, thoughts, either about the General Assembly in general or about any of the bills we lifted up? Maddie, I see your comment here. Are these goals for the year or for the, the legislative session specifically? They're for our whole year, but, and I see Rosie left, so I should probably go to <laughs> the house the next <laughs> meeting, but uh, yeah, they're for the whole year, but I mean, as long as it takes, we could support it. So I'll, I'll touch base with y'all later and I'll look for those slides to share soon. So thank you. Sounds good. Sounds good. You. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, <clears throat> like I said, we're going to be sending out weekly updates expect calls from action. Hey, this bill went to this committee. Hey, this other bill is bad. Call your people and tell them no. But if there's anything you need to help support your work during the General Assembly, you have questions, you want someone to accompany you to a lobby meeting or whatever it is, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. In the slides, there is contact information at the end for all three of us. So please do reach out and we can we can do this thing together. Together. All right, friends. Thank you for coming, and yeah. we'll be in touch. Bye, everyone. <laughs>